One morning a week, I frequent a local nature reserve to walk and to pray. This habit has become where I go to meet with God in summer, autumn, winter, and spring. This time of year, I wade into the brown leaves like waves on a beach. The sky is blue, the sun is bright, the colors glistening. There comes a point when the gravel trail turns right, but a narrower, less obvious dirt path veers slightly left and into the forest, which soon leads to a grassy path through a series of fields beyond the main and more heavily trafficked walkway, which is where my soul comes home to itself and to God each week. If it were not for the sound of traffic nearby on Route 2, I might imagine that I am traversing a public footpath in English countryside. I find space to breathe. Autumn is my favorite season. Isn't it yours? If not, don't tell me. I don't want to know. Each year, I discover a renewed sense of wonder at the colors of dying leaves. Death, in every shade of brown and orange and yellow and red, and even, if I'm not mistaken, in just the right light, purple. I wonder, too, at the unmistakable sound of shifting and crunching beneath my feet, as though the earth is chewing up and digesting these fallen leaves, as though they are fallen soldiers or fallen stars. Is it not a miracle? How can death be so beautiful? I ask myself every autumn as I walk upon death itself, grounding it further into the earth beneath my feet and knowing, trusting, hoping that that which has died one day, not too long from now, may become the soil for new birth. Autumn is fleeting, and so is life. Today is All Saints Sunday. A day when we remember those who have passed on from this life to the next, whose bodies by way of death have been laid into the ground, returned to the elements, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, reminding us that that is where we too may someday join them. For me, there is something in these natural cycles of death that remind me of my own human limitations, those niggly little things I'd rather soon ignore, like how I must have learned in seminary only about 5% of what I apparently now need to know to be a pastor. Or how each week seems like a triage of choices between giving proper attention to my sermon and proper attention to the administration of the church and proper attention to pastoral care. Not to mention the constant barrage of choices over how much of myself to devote to parenting or friendship or having a clean house or how much to devote to folding laundry and healthy food, and getting enough sleep, and taking care of my body, and answering emails, and the list goes on. I am painfully limited. And I know that you are too. That is what it means to be human. We are limited in time, in finances, in physical and emotional energy. We are limited in knowledge and wisdom in patience with ourselves and with others. We are limited, and I don't like it. The letter to the Ephesians is purportedly written by a man who has become concretely aware of his own limitations. 
especially because he has been arrested and put in prison. He is literally confined to the limitations of a jail cell. And in his shackles, Paul writes to the Christians at Ephesus, reminding them that they, together with him and believers all around the world, are the body of Christ. In other words, Paul is saying that when we embrace our human limitations, whether those limitations be the four walls of a jail cell or the four seasons of the year, we are set free to be a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. When we humbly accept that our agendas, no matter how important, are only one agenda in a complex system, we are loosened from our shackles and released to be together the full presence of Christ in our world. Perhaps Paul achieves that insight because he's confined to a jail cell. But his insight is deeper than that, too. Paul makes it clear that he is a Jewish Christian writing to Gentile Christians. And to those believers who are fundamentally different from him, to those believers whose primary concerns and background and lifestyles choices differ profoundly from his own, Paul says, I need you. You can do things that I cannot. You can see things that I cannot. You understand things that I will never understand. I am incomplete without you. Alone, Paul says, I am limited. But when we come together in the body of Christ, God's unlimited power is unleashed through us. If we want to get as specific as assigning body parts, I imagine that in the body of Christ, I, as a preacher, might be the mouth, proclaiming the word of God. The mouth's job is vitally important, and yet it can't do much of anything at all without the rest of the body to support and uphold it. This weekend, we had our church fair, which meant that the old mouth got to be quiet for a little while, while some other parts of Christ's body got the chance to shine. I could never in a million years organize a church fair the way that Sam does, or fry chicken the way that Bill does, or procure auction donations the way that Belinda does. This weekend, the mouth got to stand agape in awe at the gifts of other parts of Christ's body. Alone, we are limited. But when we come together in the body of Christ, God's unlimited power is unleashed through us. But this isn't just about appreciating other people's gifts. To stop there would be to make God's word into nothing more than a hallmark card, a, a nice message, but not enough to change our lives. Alternatively, the good news of the body of Christ is that together, and only together, the image of God, the very image of God, is revealed in us. And the work of Christ, the actual work of Christ, is accomplished through us. In a world where generational differences threaten to divide us like a surgical knife, as Christians, we are connected by tissues and ligaments that the world has long since destroyed. We are part of a body where those who are young are always fully welcome. 
even if their hair is a weird color or their politics seem outrageous. And where those who are old are always fully valued, even if their memories are failing or their ideas seem a little outdated to some people, and where those who have died are always being resurrected again. My dad died young. He was healthy, and he did all the things you're supposed to do, and yet the cancer came. He was 57, and I was 24. On the day he breathed his last breath, he became the first person whom I would have the privilege of being with in the last moments of human life. My dad's death was a catalyst for me to accept the calling that God had placed on my life to pastoral ministry. Within just a few months after his passing, I started seminary. And as I live out my vocation and my calling today, my father's life and legacy are resurrected in me. Alone, we are limited. But together, in the body of Christ, God's unlimited power is unleashed through us. In the coming weeks and months, the beautiful fall leaves will start to decompose with the help of animals and bacteria and fungi, creating a layer of decaying organic matter that will be converted into simple carbon dioxide and water. This new layer will act as a protective blanket and a sponge, absorbing dew and rainfall and acting as a continued source of nutrients and water for tree roots throughout the winter. Just as our natural world is connected in the cycles of death and rebirth through the Earth's body, so we too, in life and in death, are connected through Christ's body. Alone, we are limited, but together, God's unlimited power is unleashed through us. In the name of the Father and the Son, in the Holy Spirit. Amen.